Doug, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for coming on. Stoic. Thanks for having me, man. No worries. It's been a long time coming. Yeah. Uh, I'll try not to take over the show. I'm, yeah, I feel like you should be on my show, but uh, I'm going on your show first. So let's do it. <laughs> I've got the question that everybody wants to know first. Are you wearing pants for the interview? Yeah, I may or may not. You know, it's it's like uh, a Monero ring signature. You know, you can you could you could try to figure it out. That's hilarious. O- odds are no. Okay. <laughs> um. So let's dig into the real stuff here. So CBDCs, social credit scores. So obviously, where we're at in the world, CBDCs are being trialed in China. The EU strongly hinting at it. America's doing like the Fed now trial program. Even Australia, the RBA came out a week or two weeks ago and said that basically planting the narrative for a CBDC. Social credit scores, obviously, we see in China. Where are you thinking we're at with the whole CBDC play uh, and the social credit play? And what do you think the dangers are? I mean, we're definitely headed in that direction. And that's what's terrifying. Uh, it's literally happening in real time. Uh, It's just the natural progression of things, right? As uh, governments gain more technology, they use that technology to further their mission of creating a stronger centralized government. Um, So I think we're 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 inching in that direction at an accelerated pace, and uh, it's terrifying. And it's just you know the it's what we've all uh, read about, right? Uh, It's dystopia, uh, and we're watching it happen in real time. And obviously. You know, that's why I'm a Monero fan. We can get into that. So let's break down the nuance of it a little bit. So scalability, expand on scalability, I suppose. What what do you think? Uh, what Why do you think Monero has the best scalability, if indeed you do think that? Uh, well, I don't know if it has the best scalability, but I think it is built to scale. Uh, I think it's architected beautifully, um, given its dynamic block size. Uh, and how that works in tandem with the tail emission. And I think it just creates a nice, beautifully designed system that effectively uh, becomes more efficient the more it's used. And it's geared towards encouraging transacting versus encouraging, um, you know, storing your your coins and not moving them. And um, who is a genuine question, like who actually did a lot of the work on scalability? Who did a lot of the work? Uh, I mean, it's hard to say. Arctic Mine, obviously, is is the pro in that area. Um, but who, like, actually implemented dynamic block size? I don't know, like, all the guys that were involved in that. But I assume Arctic was involved in that. So I know a big point for you is fungibility. Um, I heard you on Twitter Spaces a lot talking about fungibility, obviously, versus Bitcoin. So tell me, like, the importance of fungibility for you. Uh, I think just on a technological uh, level, uh, the most efficient crypto will be the one that is most fungible, that actually uh, has achieved fungibility uh, because it reduces a lot of friction uh, when people are using the system because there's, there's no way for people to mark coins. If there's no way for coins to be marked, then you won't have this whole uh, entire surveillance system built on top of it. Uh, so just on a technological level, I think it just leads to a more efficient system. Uh, then in terms of money, obviously, you know, I think arguably the best form of money is something that is fungible. And for those very same reasons, it leads to uh, efficient commerce where the medium of exchange isn't something that's open to interpretation. Uh, it's just a protocol that everybody trusts and believes, and it's just used for transferring value. And why specifically don't you think Bitcoin has fungibility? Because you can build a surveillance system on top of it because it's perfectly traceable. Um, blockchain tech, not, you know, um, by, by, its, by its very nature, what we're trying to do here, which is share a ledger, uh, if, that, if that ledger is transparent, then you've created something that can be uh, perfectly surveilled if enough resources are put towards it. And if you can surveil it, um, it's there's no way it can be fungible because you know transactions will be treated differently based on their recorded histories. So a lot of Bitcoiners will say uh, Lightning, will say Coin Joins. Um, why don't you think Coin Join and Lightning? Uh, Coin Join and Lightning. Um, I mean, I'll be honest with you. I don't, I don't know those technologies deeply, but it'd be like it's more like why 
Lightning and Koi join when you can use something uh, like Monero that works on the base protocol level and it scales up for the uses of digital cash. So why use something uh, that's trying to be a band-aid for a broken blockchain that uh, you know doesn't allow people to transact without being surveilled? So I guess you could you could use those things to kind of try to get back to what Bitcoin was supposed to be. Uh, but I think just fundamentally, uh, because it's, it's, it's more abstract and it's on top of a base layer that it just leaves, it, it, it creates an even more potentially, um, co-optable system, right? So, uh, this stuff really works at its core, uh, if it's resistant to government control and takeover. And so I think when you start to, uh, do things like coin join and building second layers uh, to solve the issues of fungibility. Um, you're opening up the, the entire system to potentially being co opted because it becomes less decentralized. So, you used to be Bitcoin Maxi, right? Like, you started in Bitcoin. Yeah, I mean, I, I like, you know, like anybody else, for, well, I guess not. But yeah, like, uh, you know, that was, I actually, Dogecoin was the first coin that I purchased. That was in 2013 Christmas. So whatever, wow, what, what's the anniversary there, right? It was, it was on Christmas Eve that I bought my Doge. I had like looked at crypto before and watched it without investigating it or understanding it, right? Just seeing that there was this thing called Bitcoin that people were doing. And I thought it was, you know, like any other attempt, it was essentially centralized and it was going to be shut down but I never did the research to understand that there's some breakthrough in tech, right? Um, but Do Doge came along and it was like advertised as uh, here's something where you could, you were goodbye a little bit of it. Nobody really knows about it yet. So I was like, oh, I missed the Bitcoin, that Bitcoin thing, which is going to fail anyway. Once they realize it's centralized, but I could grab $50 worth of Doge and I'll get whatever thousands of Doge. And I bought it on Christmas Eve and I woke up Christmas morning and I went to check my online Doge wallet and all my Doge was gone. It was all it was all stolen, along with everybody else that had their Doge stored on this uh, service. So that was my first lesson in crypto because I was like, I was like, crypto is so dumb. I'm like, this is so dumb. All your money just gets stolen like that. I'm like, there's got to be something else to Bitcoin. There's no way everybody just. Like, so that led me down the Bitcoin rabbit hole. I was like, oh, your private key and all I get is and like so yeah. That and then I got sucked into Bitcoin. I was like, this makes total sense. And it was actually similar to the time we're in now because when I really got into it, that was yeah, like. 2014 that's when gox mount gox happened and that's when i was already like so excited about the tech right I, like i was trying to throw money into it it was like 800 it was going down just kept going down i was rooting for it to go down i was like here's my chance to you know get some bitcoin and when mount gox happened it crashed and uh you know it was no different to what we saw with the recent exchange the ftx right it was it's the same exact thing. Uh, it has absolutely nothing to do with crypto itself. If anything, it just further proves that, you know, what, what Bitcoin or Monero's true value is. So how did you get but, into yeah, Monero? Then? What, why did you move away from Bitcoin? Uh, yeah. So, you know, I was, I was obsessed with Bitcoin uh, for what I thought it was, which is digital cash, censorship resistant digital cash. And when I started using Bitcoin is when I started to realize what its flaw was right away. You know, even, uh, you know, in the very early days, like, oh, I could go check my wallet. I mean, if I could check my wallet, I guess somebody else could check my wallet, you know, and I sent the little Bitcoin to some of my friends and they're like messaging me back. Oh, cool. I didn't. Uh, wow. You got you got you got a lot of Bitcoin. Where'd you get them all? You know, it's like. That's not normal. Normally, if I give my get friend 50 bucks, he doesn't know how much I have in my bank account. Like, it, I, how is this going to scale? How is this going to work? And, you know, when I went to, like, go make a purchase online, I'm thinking about this and realizing, wait a minute, this purchase is going to be saved in perpetuity for somebody to see in the future, right? Like, I, you know, Literally um, forever. so that scared that. Yeah. And so that scared the hell out of me. Um, and so I was interested in that problem you know, in solving that problem. And I didn't see anybody in Bitcoin doing it. And then uh, with the whole Bcash fiasco and, you know, the, the block size wars, I that combined with Bitcoin lacking fungibility, Monero, I then saw as this other project that was that had solved this problem. 
and that also wasn't having this block size war issue. It, it just checked a lot of boxes. And um, that's when I moved over to Monero. And really, for me, it was kind of a philosophical decision. I'm like, what am I in this for? Because my, my fear with moving over to Monero was, is this a, a bad financial decision, right? Like, I believe so much in Bitcoin. And now I'm going to move over to Monero. But then, like, you know, I justified it in my mind by thinking, you know, what am I what am I really in this for? And what excites me most is the disruptive nature of it, right? This idea that we can track, can, can transact without any surveillance, without any government being able to see any transactions. That, that's what really what I would found most exciting about this tech. So I was willing to gamble on all that and say, you know, all right, maybe if I, it would have been smarter, if I just held on to Bitcoin, maybe I'd end up with more money in fiat over time or for some period of time. But I was like, but how much more? It probably won't be significant enough. Like I'd rather have, you know, would I rather have a million dollars in completely traceable currency or, you know, $500,000 of completely untraceable currency? I was like, I want the, you know, I want Monero. So with that said, um, dark nets, what significance does that have to you that Monero is used basically exclusively on the dark nets or at least trending towards domination on the dark net? I mean, it's just the best indicator that we have that it that it's winning as digital cash because the market is choosing Monero. There's no, you know, that's that's the true use case. Can it be used in a digital cash like manner where people can't see how you're transacting, right? So if you're going to make a transaction like that, uh, and if you're choosing Monero, then that means you're you're voting that that Monero does that better than any other crypto. And so I think it's just a vote of confidence for Monero, which shows that it's winning. So um, Monero adoption. So how do you see it playing out? So where are we at today, and where are we going, basically? Uh, I think uh, from when I've been in it, you know, times have never been better, right? In every, in terms of every metric, the actual transaction counts keep going up, but just the, you know, my anecdotal uh, observations, you know, seeing people like you, right? Like I, 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 you know, you're, you're kind of relatively, I don't know how long you've been lurking in the, in the background of the community, but in terms of being out there, you know, trying to start your, your podcast, you have a book coming out. Like for me, that's, but like, wow, look at the, here's somebody who's decided to devote their time towards Monero, just like I did. And so I'm seeing a lot more of these people. And obviously I'm sure you'd agree. Uh, they, they, they have good vibes, right? Intelligent people, level-headed people seemingly in, in it for the right reasons, not just talking about number go up, um, and I see that that culture in Monero growing and the amount of people that are you know, interested in that culture growing. So I think the trend is very positive. Um, and where do I see? I just continue to see that trend grow, especially you know, as governments become more tyrannical and the fear of dystopia becomes more obvious to people around the world, which is happening at an accelerating rate. Um, just saw, you know, with COVID, everything went down with that. And it's just every day, I think we're all like, equal, like sh more shocked, right? It's like, it's shocking to now see the things that are happening, things that you wouldn't even imagine, right, are, are, are starting to happen. And so that's just going to push people towards the solution. Um, I guess initially, maybe they'll, they'll start with something like Bitcoin. But like we said, for all these reasons, once they actually go to use it, you know, it's like the Venmo thing, right? Like, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but, you know, now the U.S. is is taxing all or they want to see all transactions, I think over $600 or it might be even all transactions. Like, it's going to be all transactions, right? Because the data is there, right? So, but when people wake up to that and yeah, they're going to, because it's going to hit, it's going to hit home for them. You know, they have, might have a small business and they use Venmo to accept all their payments. And, you know, for them, it's like using cash and they're going to wake up to the, it's not like cash. You just got a letter from the IRS, uh, you know, little things like that. And all these little things are happening more and more often uh, as governments are, are gaining more power and more ability to, to track and trace things. That's going to push more people into something like the Monero. Sure, man. I mean, one thing I worry about is essentially that, you know, as the toxic maxi culture is, it's obviously the crypto with the greatest network effect at the moment. It's probably going to continue, to, at least in my view, it's probably going to continue to be like the number one crypto um, in terms of use cases, adoption. 
So one thing I worry about with that is that people sort of get stuck on Bitcoin, especially people who are not familiar with crypto. So they come in, whatever, they do their shitcoin thing, then they go into Bitcoin and then they go to like spend it, so say social credit scores implemented on it. And then people just lose faith in crypto altogether because it's the same as like Mt. Gox. It's the same as uh, FTX. A lot of people just don't actually know what's going on. They actually just blame crypto because they just have no idea. They listen to Jim Cramer and that's all they know, right? So what do you think the probabilities are of that is that Bitcoin just becomes big and then, I mean, everything that Bitcoin is supposed to solve eventually just comes straight back down on it. You say what are the what's the odds that Bitcoin doesn't actually solve the problems it's intending to solve? Or that that and is it, is it... that's the question. And as well as, uh, do you think it will scare people away? Basically, do you think it will delay long term adoption and really like long term freedom and prosperity? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I you know, I, I hate to sound greedy at a point, like, you know, but my response is, well, you know, it gives us more time to acquire you know, more Monero, right? As one way of thinking about it. And that's the way the Bitcoiners thought about it. And it's, you know, it's inevitable whether, uh, you know, it's, it's Bitcoin and Monero or, you know, eventually only Monero survives, which, which sounds extreme and drastic, but I do think it's more resistant to government control. Like if things really get crazy, I think Bitcoin can can be co-opted that's i think that's a bigger concern people getting scared off from things like ftx i mean that's just temporary that's like it was just no difference than mount gox and that, well, what's going to happen all right maybe less people use crypto but decentralized exchanges are going to become much more user friendly and then when those people eventually come back because they're like they see that it's still around and that thing that they own that was 30 cents that's now 30 dollars or whatever you know and they see the price they're going to come back they're going to come back into it so yeah no i don't think people anybody's getting scared out on a big level but it may, it's going to it's slowing adoption but it's also correcting the market and moving the market towards what this tech needs to be which is decentralized so all, those things are bullish for me when i see like an ftx bigger question i suppose maybe even a little bit of philosophical question like how long do you think i mean what do you even think is going to happen do you think the fiat ponzi is going to collapse do you think they'll like drag it out somehow how, like how do you see adoption playing out in that sense i mean it's, it's such a big beast right to say the fiat ponzi is going to collapse it's integ the fiat ponzi is integrated into crypto itself right it's like Crypto is going to change it in a very large way, but I don't think it's going to eradicate fiat or it's going to be, it's on such a large time scale. It's, it's, you know, it's just going to kind of shape shift and fiat will have, I guess, you know, less control and crypto uh, will eventually gain, gain more. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't think the fiat Ponzi is collapsing anytime soon. I think People are obviously, you know, people who are, are are becoming more cognizant of it, right? With inflation and everything, I feel like they're they're more cognizant of these things, so that's going to push people over into crypto. But I don't think there's, you know, going to be this like moment where fiat dies and Bitcoin just completely takes over, like anytime soon. I don't think it's going to be as dramatic, you know. I don't know. Yeah, it, yeah. it's like you say, it's a big topic. Um, so. Going back into the nuance of Bitcoin and Monero for a bit there. So we talked about scalability, fungibility, but ASIC mining versus CPU mining. Um, a lot of people out there, even within the Bitcoin community, are not totally familiar with the trade-offs. So give us a quick overview and what do you think is better? Uh, I love the idea of ASIC resistant mining, that CPU, you know, CPU mine essentially, which is what Monero is, because it's more closer to the ideal of one CPU, one vote. And it's, that's, once again, it's all about creating the system that's most robust and resistant to government control or influence, which is basically the, the system that's most decentralized. So on a, on a, on a mining network level, uh, if you could have people mining with their CPUs and they could uh, fairly compete against any other CPU, it allows for a more egalitarian system or widespread system where anybody with access to a CPU, which we all have, we all have one in our pocket everywhere around the world and access to energy and the internet can now without permission participate in the Monero network. Um, so it's just really hard to shut that down. 
how do you shut that down? As opposed to ASIC miners, uh, which have become these behemoth mining centers that are essentially in cahoots with the governments that they're operating in, because that's the nature of corporations once they get larger, right? They they become entwined with the local government, the right. So they 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 by by their very nature they become co-opted, and so. Uh, Bitcoin is trending in that direction, given its ASICs and Monero currently, well, I don't know if, if it's feasible long term, but uh, is is CPU mined. And it's definitely a, a major benefit to the decentralization and essentially the censorship resistance of the network. And why do you think Bitcoin Maxis push so hard against it? Um, I think they think that, well, I don't know if they really think it's theoretically impossible because we see it's not theoretically impossible, right? Because it is because it, it exists. Um, I, th I think their arguments are interesting because, you know, they I th we're, we're essentially trying to arrive at the same point, just taking two different approaches. So at the end of the day, uh, it's, it's about, uh, you know, it's going to trend towards this this piece of hardware that will be easy for anybody to obtain anywhere, even in, in Bitcoin, that's essentially what will happen. It'll become a commodity. Uh, it's just, but with Monero, they started at the commodity level. So I, why, why Bitcoin or, yeah, I think they just think because it's not their approach. They, they went the other approach and so they don't like the idea that we're saying we found a better one. I think it's as simple as that. And they have Bitcoin bags and they feel threatened by, uh, you know, the fact that Monero might be onto something with this. Do you feel, um, like, how do you feel about the Bitcoin Monero debate? Like, do you even think it's relevant? Do you think they can like coexist together or do you think they uh, basically zero sum game when they take away from each other? No, I think they definitely can code because they're literally, uh, great hedges for one another. Right. So they very slight design decisions that are different. Bitcoin is fundamentally transparent. Monero is fundamentally obfuscated and private. Bitcoin has fixed block sizes. Monero has dynamic block sizes. Bitcoin has a fixed coin supply. Monero has a, a you know a tail emission. Um, even you know the a, a basic encryption that's used to encrypt uh, Monero is slightly different than Bitcoin's. Um, so, uh, some argue less chance of having some theoretical backdoor, right? Which you know I, I wouldn't even dare to make that, but there people do argue that, right? Uh, so I think to say one is better, they definitely can coexist because it's it's these two bohe great technologies that uh, are have these fundamental differences um, that kind of, that are going to allow them to compete in different ways. So I have a philosophical question, which I ask everybody. Um, what do you mean to Monero's fail? Because I think it's very important to have obviously reasons why you're right, but also, you know, points, uh, say where the information changes, where you admit, okay, I was wrong. So what do you mean to Monero's failed? At what point would I be like, all right, I, I fucked up Monero felt like it's yes. Um, I mean, I guess if we, if we, if we woke up and it became known that it wasn't actually this decentralized technology and it was somehow being controlled and it was hacked, but, uh, you know, given my ability to understand those that understand it more deeply, that's not the case. And that it, that's not something that would just, you know, like that a black swan event like that just really is not likely given the fact that this is all open source tech that's built on math that very intelligent people have looked at from all different aspects and angles that don't have the incentive to or to, to really collude, right? Because it's built in a way that they're all independently, you know, looking at it. So for i would say you know it failed if something like that happens but i don't see how I, what you know if that happens that could just as easily happen to bitcoin or any other crypto um i guess the real potential failure is it just doesn't gain adoption right that would be that would be the failure right society just doesn't adopt it and use it as digital cash so currently that's happening it's being used on the dark markets where people need digital cash but yeah, in some scenario where some other form of crypto started 
being used more for those purposes, then I would say that is, you know, Monero failing, whatever else is replacing it is succeeding at digital cash. And I'd be very interested in what that is. And I'd probably be at the forefront of seeing that happen. So I'd probably get interested in that and start pursuing that. I'm not, I'm not a Monero maxi in that I love the, I do love the, the word Monero. I think it's a great name, but I'm, I'm, I'm fine with owning some other thing if it's doing Monero better. So tell us about Monero Topia 2023. Monero Topia 2023 will be uh, May 6th and 7th in Mexico City. Last year or last time we did it in Miami alongside the big Bitcoin conference. Now we're doing it off on our own in Mexico City. We found an awesome venue. We're going to have like a Monero uh, market taking place where we have local vendors from Mexico City that are going to be there selling their, you know, tacos and handmade crafts for Monero. Uh, we're going to have that alongside a like traditional conference where we'll have speakers, primarily people that are going to come and talk about Monero technology, but they're going to come and talk about other privacy coins as well and other privacy tech. And then we have workshops. Uh, for beginners, we're going to try to onboard complete noobs to Monero, try to get them to come to the conference, people local to in Mexico City. We're going to have more advanced workshop for people that want to, you know, run a full node in my Monero. Uh, and yeah, that's it. We have, a, we have a VIP ticket where you can hang out with the speakers and we have a general admission ticket and we tried to keep tickets super, super low. We want this to be very accessible. Anybody that wants to attend or participate, you know, reach out to me email me i can imagine Aerotopia that's Pro i can imagine that you're going to be What's in that? your element there i can i can imagine you're going to be in your element there being at like the table on boarding the noobs i can just like it's a content machine for you <laughs> <laughs> i love spreading the good word of monero man so yeah monero topia is all i don't you weren't at miami right were you there no i wasn't i was stuck in the gulag no you weren't you'll be at Monero. you'll be there right monero topia yeah 100 percent. yeah all right so yeah, man, we'll be we'll be hanging out. And uh, anybody that's listening to this, that for some reason, whatever, it's too expensive, you know, reach out to me for that too. We want as many people as possible to participate. We'll figure out how to help you out, get over there. But uh, we kept the tickets super cheap. It's super cheap to stay in Mexico City, as you know, right? Um, compared to Miami, oh my God, Miami's like three hundred and thirty bucks a night. Mexico City's like forty bucks. But yeah, it's just going to be a big digital cash uh, powwow people that believe in in these concepts where can we get a ticket up monerotopia.com doug thanks so much for coming on thank you man thanks for doing this